Well, welcome everyone to Geohug. Happy Friday. So this week's rock star is Peter Betts and he's structural geophysicist in the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment at Monash Uni. And he'll be chatting to us a day today about why a geologist thinks he's a ge geophysicist and geophysicist thinks he's a geologist. So thank you so much for joining us. This is his second time back. I'm thrilled to have him. He gave an excellent talk a few months back. Uh, yeah, about the crisis of geoscience, which was amazing. You should catch up if you haven't seen it. But yes, thank you so much, Pete, for coming. And yeah, can't wait to hear from you. Hey, thanks, Jess, again. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And despite 15 months of only doing Zoom, I'm <laughs> still sucking at it. <laughs> okay, so Jess asked me to come along and give a talk again. Um, and you know, I'm in the same environment as I was last time, which is my bedroom. Um, it's not as moody as Laurent's uh, um, study, but it's, uh, it's yeah, we're about to, we're, we're out of lockdown in, in, in Melbourne. And what that really means for everyone who's living there is the cage is slightly bigger. It's uh, it's not uh, it's not really feeling much different. So I look, I've, I'm going to give a talk. Um, it's called structural geophysicists. Why geologists think I'm a geophysicist, and geophysicists think I'm a geologist, and and um, and hopefully you'll see how I landed there. Um, so I could retitle that when I'm a geologist, I don't understand the math, and I'm a geophysicist, but I don't know what the mineral is. That's the other way. And in some ways, I have felt like I've bluffed my way through two disciplines through my 30 years of um, being involved in, in, in the academic um, community. Uh, and it is, it is quite, um, it's quite interesting um, to reflect on, on your journey when, when you don't really know what you are. So I have two pieces of feedback that really early on, I was a young man back in the early 1990s, um, and we had a professor called Jim Cole who was an electromagnetic um, and magnetic telluric expert, and he was he was angling for me to become a geophysicist, and I actually was thinking um, along those lines. Um, and... When I chose to do a, a, an honours project with uh, Rick Valenta, who some of you will have met a few weeks ago um, when Steve Micklewaite gave his talk, um, he said to me, shame you do structural geology, you would have made a good geophysicist. And, and two years later when I was doing my PhD and it looked like I was uh, um, not doing any more geophysics and I was becoming a more like a structural geologist or a geologist, um, um, my supervisor at the time, a guy called Gordon Lister, said to me, it's a pity you like geophysics because you would make a good structural geologist. And they're both very scarring uh, uh, quotes because actually um, it really showed that I wasn't really um, um, what I uh, didn't know what I was really doing at the time. I was kind of just flicking between the two of these disciplines and, and fumbling my way around. And I didn't think I was particularly... Um, with PhD student and, and, and Laurent, who, who our duty goes back to that time, probably would argue that. So there's Rick. He was a guy at Monash University at the time. He's now at UQ, who, who sat in the middle of structural geology and, and, uh, and geophysics along with a, a guy called Mark Jessel. And, uh, and Rick basically put me under his ring, uh, uh, wing and, um, and, and you know, gave me a project that was uh, combining structural geology and and geophysics and, and Rick was a structural geologist by training and, and started to um, delve and, and, and play with geophysics at the time. Of course, Rick can always look like that. This is what he looked like in the halcyon days of my astrology. Um, that's me when I was a redhead and not gray and significantly thinner. The guy in the middle is my brother who was, uh, who was my field assistant for uh, a period of time, and it was Rick, and, and and Rick was a cracker in the field. He uh, he certainly made it a, a lot of fun. So so this is my journey, and so I've color coded it. It's like when I thought I was a geophysicist, and when I thought I was a, a geologist, and and before even before then, I did a computer um, survey back in 1987 in high school, and um, had to answer 100 questions that told me what job I wanted to do, and the and it spat out three jobs. It's shit. Number one was a surveyor. Um, number two was a geologist. Number three was a geophysicist. 
and and I chose not to be a surveyor because the year before that I was a work experience person with the town council in East Gippsland where the pies are made, and uh, and the only job they gave me was to hold the stop sign. Like the lollipop lady or the or the lollipop guys that sit there with their with their sort of ass crack showing and uh, and uh, and doing that anyway, I hated it. I was like, you know, as a as a as a sixteen year old, I was super bored. So I was like, off to uni I go to be a, a geophysicist. That's what I had in my head. Um, and after failing first year maths, no physics, I. Uh, I uh, got told that I was never welcome back into the School of Physics ever again and they would pass me through. And so I did another year of mathematics and then and then it was all all uh, rocks after that. And I majored in um, geology and geophysics and at that point I was like, I'm going to be a geophysicist. And then for my PhD, what happened was I was supposed to do a pro- part of a project that was the geophysics bit and Rick wanted me to do that. And, uh, and another guy from overseas, from, from Wales, um, was supposed to do the, the geology bit. And that guy Ned just never showed up. And so at some point in the first six months of my PhD, Rick said to me, mate, you're going to have to do both. And I was like, okay. And then so I pivoted uh, uh, that early on in my PhD and basically started um, mapping. And then, and so then I did two postdocs. One was in, in Mount Isa after the, my PhD, which is where I did my PhD. And then one was in the Gaula Craton. And, uh, and and for both of those times, I was pretty much behaving like like a geologist. And it wasn't only towards the end of the uh, the postdoc in the Gaula Craton did I start to re-engage um, with geophysics again. And I basically had to learn um, all the software, etc. Again. And and Robin will be sniggering in the in the in the audience there because every time I can't use the software now, I give him a call and say. Give me a hand, mate, and he and he always does. So, and he's a geochemist, which is actually even more embarrassing for me. Um, and then, and then after that, I basically was employed as a bunch of uh, contract lecturer, and was asked to teach geophysics. So, basically, from that point on, I started to integrate the both, both of them, into the way I thought about the world. This, of course, led to lots of confusion with my colleagues. Um, so for almost all of my career, if I went and surveyed my uh, good friends in this, my own school who should know what I do, some of them say that I'm a geophysicist and some of them say I'm a geologist, which is really interesting because even in 2018, which is 25 years into my career, I still had colleagues asking me what I do. So I do wear my failure to, um, to sell exactly what I do to my colleagues um, as, as a badge of honour, and I like to keep them confused. Of course, this led to all sorts of things, um, and this is now how I perceive myself in the world. I feel like I can do two things reasonably well, um, and uh, and the only guy on the planet that I could find an analogy to was 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 Dave Grohl, okay? So that's how I perceive myself as a result of all the confusion that led up to it. Um, I do want to talk about interdisciplinary science. It's a big word we use when fighting around management at, at the university. And I, I think it gets misused a lot because um, um, what, what um, the university often means when they talk about interdisciplinary is actually talk about what they're really t- talking about is multidisciplinary. Um, so interdisciplinary science is really the approach um, where we develop um, process skills and concepts um, of at least two disciplines at the same time. So they've got to be intimately linked. It's not like you um, could throw, you look at a, so try and solve a problem and you bring in a geochemist and uh, a structural geologist and go, I want you to tackle this together um, to solve this problem. That's a sort of uh, multidisciplinary po- approach. The interdisciplinary approach is where the two disciplines that you're um, combining are intimately intertwined. And I think structural geophysics is, is the one true example of this approach um, in, in, um, in earth sciences. Of course, most of our colleagues that float around uh, in academia uh, don't fit the multidisciplinary or the interdisciplinary. They are discipline experts. Um, the system is set up in general so that they become that. So most, most of our colleagues are very good at one thing. And in fact, they're, they're so expert at it, there's only uh, a few of them on the planet who have the same amount of expertise on that particular topic that they are. And that's encouraged and that's how you get deep knowledge, but, um, which is 
what we strive for in academia. But the reality is some of the most challenging questions can't be resolved that way. They actually either result, need a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary approach. I think earth sciences as a, as a broad family of, um, of, of um, expertise naturally fits in the multidisciplinary um, category. So if you think about um, your work environment and when you have a problem and you might throw multiple methods at it, you often throw um, different disciplines at it. So exploration might use a chief chemist and geophysicist and structural geologist. Um, they might talk to each other, but they don't intertwine what they're doing necessarily that well. Um, so, point. Um, so why is structural ge geophysics um, important? Well, there's two points I really want to make in this slide. Um, the top one is uh, is basically uh, one of Richard Trudy's um, images from about five or six years ago. Now, when he did a, an analysis of you know where the big deposits are, um, which is how big the bubble is and how um, how deep they are, and and what's immediately apparent from from that um, image is that um, there's lots of yellow and and uh, even some white dots, which means there's um, lots of ore deposits that we're really good at finding near the surface. And as we get deeper, the dots get, the dark blue dots get fewer. And we, as a broad community, are generally pretty poor at finding ore deposits, um, even at a, at a modest depth that's around 200 or greater. Um, people will tell you their success stories. Olympic Dam is one of them. Um, and that's a challenge. So we need to use techniques that can see under, underneath uh, at depth. So, and, and geophysics is one of those things. And the other interesting thing about many water deposits is that they're structurally controlled. Um, and, so, uh, and so if you can combine um, that, those structural approaches with uh, geophysical analysis, then, then you've got a, a, a tool or a weapon to, to apply that with. Um, um, so I would argue that when you do a geophysical interpretation, it's actually not just about making a map, it's actually about making a structural map and trying to understand um, and what those structures mean. And, uh, and they have some advantage. So um, usually um, we're talking about three-dimensionality of uh, rock um, volumes um, and structural geology deals with that and so, so does um, um, geophysics. Um, I talk about the kinematics and I should be talking about the overprint as well and I've got another slide that outlines this. Um, but if you can figure out the structural control and you can actually map those structures out, at least you've got something to, to bring to you. Um, so here's this how they, how they connect and I kind of introduced it in the previous slide. So these are the two most, these are the, these, um, and, and Boyd from South Australia, there's three um, people who were, um, who were um, integral into, into developing this, um, this, this discipline, so this, this interdiscipline of, of geosciences. So Mark's now a professor at UWA, Rick's a professor at uh, UQ. Um, but they, these guys, when they were doing this, were young men and they were um, really playing on the edge of um, techniques, et cetera. And, and so, so, um, so what I'm saying is, is the, the three points I want to make here, I'm going to put my pointer on. Bear with me for a second. The, the laser pointer. So really, um, you know, as if I put my structural geology hat on and when I can't understand the maths and you go, what is the purpose of a structural geologist? They're really concerned with these three things, 3D geometry, determining the overprinting relationships, which is actually the sequence of, of deformation events that leads to that three-dimensional geometry. And then how did the rocks move when that was happening? So the kinematics, okay? And so... If you apply those three concepts to, um, say, gravity or aeromag or other um, geophysical techniques, they're exactly the same. And that is why these two disciplines are interdisciplinary. So there's this parity between the objectives of both that work really well, and that means that you can apply the lessons from one discipline to the other and vice versa, which is really um, powerful. Unfortunately, this doesn't always happen. And so here's a, here's a Ford model that I've just stolen off Mark. Um, and, and this is a typical approach. I still see this approach today. And it is, uh, 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 and all this is, 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 is the construction of, of some um, 
some bodies which are coloured blue and orange in this, and they're given an arbitrary or they're given a rock property, and then the geometry and or the rock property are changed until they get a, a satisfactory match between the um, the observed geophysical response and the calculated one. And so this sort of reductionist approach um, is common. And the argument is, is there's so many uncertainties, let's just make it as simple as possible to figure out what's going on. And I would argue that neither of those two bodies floating around in rock space represent anything that would ever look like geology. And so you end up with this sort of um, approach that's not very, um, not very um, geological, and it's still applied today. And it usually is applied by um, groups of geophysicists whose understanding of geology, I would argue, are, are limited. Um, but that um, misunderstanding goes the other way as well. Here's, here's some cross sections that I drew in my PhD, and I didn't want to show you the location of them because we've just confused things. But, but basically, the cross section is, uh, is the geologist's view of, of of the world um, and it's usually based on surface observations and then once you get more than a meter under the surface it's a free-for-all and it's kind of made up um, and, and and when you explain that to many geologists they get really offended by that um, because but it actually is real so in this i'm going to use an example here so i've got a surface geology here yet somehow i've made this if this fire creek fault a into a normal fault and you're going to go, well, how can you tell that from those surface relationships there? And the answer was, I couldn't. But so why did I draw it as a normal fault? And the example in this case is I actually used some geophysics to help me draw that. But if I had to just constrain it from the surface geology, that relationship that's at depth would be um, would not be not be able to be determined. So so just drawing a geological cross-section is also um, is, is something that we uh, is fraught with danger when we try to understand something. So I'm going to show you this um, series of um, four um, models just to illustrate a point. It's um, from a uh, PhD student of mine for more than a decade ago, John Stewart. And at the time, I think he was producing um, some of the highest quality Ford models um, being published. Um, these are crustal scale sections um, through the Western Gaul of Craton. Um, and, uh, and I would argue that his approach was, I want to draw a geological cross section and I want to constrain it with my, in this case, his map, which is his geophysical interpretation, the magnetic and, 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 and uh, the gravity data. And applied to that is um, his conceptual and knowledge biases to that. To that problem. Now, you, I've heard many people argue that they're, they're prob that's problematic as well, and, and you can certainly make a case of that. But now this is a, some, this is a cross section in, that's actually quite detailed in, 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 its, in its glory um, that highlights and is self-consistent with the geological knowledge and the gravity and magnetic responses. So we're actually using three data sets essentially to constrain that section. And I only want to put that there to say that that's pretty much um, one of the approaches that we use in the structural geophysics group. Here's another example, and this one's really interesting because Tegan Blakey, this is now at CSIRO, she was doing a, uh, well, she was uh, doing a short-term postdoc at the time. This, is, this was her project. The Leichhardt River Fold Trough, which is in the western fold belt of the Mount Isabel, is essentially 100% outcrop. It's just it's some of the best outcrop that you'll get in Proterozoic Australia. And yet, um, without um, with with just the geological geological information, you can come up with a with a cross section that pretty much mimics the, the profile of C to C prime, in, which is through here. The, this section here goes roughly like that. Um, and here's the forward model of, of that. Okay, so they kind of look the same, um, but the, the section that's been constrained by, by this is, is, is an example of um, where you can get more or more accurate information, in my opinion, because this section not only honours the geology, but it also honours the magnetic and the gravity data set. So that's just an example.
I want to talk about the interpretation phase because that's the thing that I do most of the time. I, you know, I spend a lot of time drawing lines on well, before I became a university administrator, drawing lines on, on geophysical um, maps. And I think the best interpreters that I've met have uh, think like structural geologists. Um, and, and so in that process of creating that interpretation, he's constantly thinking about what's the three-dimensional geometry, what's the kinematics, and what's the overprinting relationship. Okay, and then when you when you incorporate um, that structural and and or tectonic analysis as knowledge into the interpretation and modeling, you are able to glean some information um, from that. So, so the knowledge I would argue is the actual data. So the data that you got, so the geophysical data, the gravity, the magnetic, the MT, the EM data, the geological observations, and then on superimposed on that is some sort of understanding of what things look like in geology. Okay, so some sort of archive, a Dewey system in the library, for the, oh, that's what a fold of thrust belt will look like, and that's what an extensional basin, the predictability of, of extensional basin is that the sediments will generally be lower density than, it, than the basement. These are the sorts of things that if you bring that to, you, to the interpretation, you'll get more out of the interpretation than otherwise. Here's some examples. So this is Pegan's example. There's the data set, spectacular. But here's some Mount Woods data. I see Caroline was in the audience before, and this is the central board. That's what I'm only showing you these, not as examples of, of the interpretation, but to really say, you know, here's, here's some interpretations, and these are the things that we, um, uh, this is the sort of approach that we would do. So we'd look at those three uh, elements, geometry, kinematics, and overprinting. The advantage of these data sets is you can do it at a relatively small scale, say a mine, mine or camp scale, and you can blow this out to a continental scale. And in, in a similar talk, I can, I can show examples across scales, which I haven't done. Um, and then you can understand the movement pictures and the history, and then you can make some sort of call on the tectonics. So you can actually do it at multi-scales, which is super important. So here's an example, um, one that I did a few years away, though. Um, I don't want to talk to too much about these points, but I do want to talk to this point um, um, about the, the advantages of making the map. And, and so whilst automation is great, and I'm going to show you an example of automation later on, which I think is uh, going to be um, very breaking, um, and, I'll, and I'll segue that into Laurent's talk in a month's time, um, the process of making a map in terms of your thinking has lots of merit. And the reason why it is, is because that um, cognitive um, activity of drawing the line and seeing how that line relates to another line in your head makes you think about the problem at a much deeper level than you would ever get if you just press a button and let an algorithm run a, uh, something in the background and then you get the answer. And there's something significant in that that is that will become or is becoming less um, less common in the way we treat our data sets, and that's something that we we need to be mindful of, I believe, because we will become lazy thinkers in the future if we rely completely on automotive approaches, and that's and that's actually a real real challenge. Okay, so um, and and with that thinking. Um, is part, part of that thinking, sorry, is the ability to understand the problem that you're trying to resolve with what you're doing. So, so, so here's a geophysical map as an example. And, and, and the scale of those, those little dots with the numbers that you can't read on it, um, that's 10K. Okay, so it's about 130 or 40K long and about, about 100K wide. Okay, and, that, and, that, and this interpretation represented about a month's worth of interpretation for a company, um, Gold Roads, and it's in the amount of block. We'll not say any more about it than that. That's the map, and you can see it's basically, I'm not going to talk to the details, but um, you, you, you get a sense from that map that um, there's a lot in it, but you don't really get it because of the scale of it is. And if I zoom into one part of it, there's some cheap physical data there. Um, it's a derivative image um, showing the trends. That's the interpretation of that. And of course, it's a significantly drill strain. And then that's the, 
that's a, a zoom in again, and there's the detail and level of detail of that. And that's to show the multi-scale nature of it, but also um, to show that um, you can glean a significant amount of information from these data sets. And this particular data set was, um, was interpretation was enhanced by um, the large volume of uh, drill hole data that helped to constrain it and, and basically the integration of those two data sets to do that. Um, I'm talking about overprinting. Um, last year we published a paper. I'm not going to use any examples of that because I think there's better ones, but, but uh, the overprinting is significant. And if you know what you're looking for, you can get lots of information out of it. And so this is the CAMN2 trough in, 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 um, in South Australia. And you can see the folding through here. So the layer, the magnetic layers that are, are folded around. And, and, and then you can see that um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's one closure and there's another closure like this. And you can see this, um, this circular um, magnetic feature here, which is a, a, a granite, it's a, um, an A-type granite, and uh, that's Cambrian in age. And it is um, overprinting and, 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 and truncating those, um, those folds. So you can get a sense of the sequence of deformations. You had the folding event in this case, and I'm not going to talk about the details, and then you had an igneous uh, intrusion event that, that essentially overprints it. And you can see this fault here that's um, truncating the limbs of both these folds. There's, uh, there's a sequence of deformation there. Now, there's no almost no outcrop there, so you can see obviously why there would be um, some advantage to interpreting um, a data set like this because there's no other constraints to do it. This is a Leichhardt River fault trough, and which is 100% outcrop. And, and in the past, we, uh, so Laurent and I in particular, who used to run this PRAC for third years, this is the image that we used to give them. And, and they used to, uh, the students used to interpret this over about a four or five week period. And we used to shake our heads at each other and go, there's something not right about this, uh, the knowledge of this part of the world. And, and here, herein lies the issue. So you can see these, these high magnetic zones through here, here shown in the red. These are the Eastern Creek Volcanics, which are a, a 1,780 million year old tholeotic uh, basaltic package um, um, deposited in a rift. And you can see if you follow them around, they are folded around like this, okay? And then you can see over printing those limbs of those folds are these sort of wedge shaped um, packages of rocks. And that's a, they're sub basins of a younger sedimentary package. So, so in, in the, before we started thinking and, and interrogating this data, the story went like this, that, that these Eastern Creek volcanics were deposited and then these basins were um, filled in with, with sediments and then this um, fold formed during post-basin history deformation. And, and so that was the paradigm and it went on this for probably 80 years, the way um, it was taught, taught and, and thought about in, in the Mount Isabel. But when you look at this data, you cannot get away from the fact that those basins are clearly overprinting that fold. Okay, that's the overprinting relationship. And so what the implication is, is that big regional fold, which is called the, the Leichhardt uh, anticline, is actually happened between the deposition of these volcanic rocks and the deposition of the rocks that fill this basin, okay? And so that is an, uh, uh, um, an event we call the Leichhardt event. The details are not important, except for to say that the macro geometry of the eastern western fold belt is actually largely driven by a folding event that was largely unrecognised um, at this scale until then. Now, there's a couple of papers out there that allude or hint to the fact that there was a, a, a basin inversion event between those two basin phases. But I think when you look at the data at a holistic scale, you get some sort of hints about what's going on. So I, um, I'm not going to put to these points except for the same that basically uh, you can apply the skills and, and knowledge that geologists apply every day of their life that they learn in first year, which is what's the secret events, this event happened first and this one, and you can apply to, um, to, um, to geophysical data sets and you can get lots of information now that may not be apparent um, necessarily on the ground. And talking a bit about kinematics, um, 
which is really a uh, Bay Rocks move. We have a whole bunch in, in structural geology, we have a whole bunch of criteria used and we sniff around rocks at all sorts of scales. Uh, looking for it, the, the laundry list is there, but really these, these features um, dominantly reflect the flow of rocks um, and minerals around rocks and minerals that are rigid. That's essentially it. Some rocks are rigid and, and so they rotate and, and, and other rocks will, will flow. And that's essentially what underpins that. So here's, here's an example of a, a folded uh, dike and there's a shear zone that goes through there and you can see this foliation bending around like this and, the, and this foliation bending around like that. And, uh, and any structural geologists walk up there without thinking and get the movement of that. We can also look at thin sections and here's some examples out of a textbook various um, types of things, whether they're um, mantle porphyry blasts that have uh, got tails on them, whether they're SC fabrics or, or micro fish. And we look at those uh, features and we go, that's how we can determine how rocks move. And those are observations that happen typically at, um, well, you can see the scale of the pen there. So that's probably half a metre across, maybe a bit more. No, sorry, a metre, it's a couple of metres across. No one has a pen that small. Um, and these are these are sort of on the on the millimeter scale, which presents challenges at a, at a larger scale. And we usually rely um, on minerals and um, and and fabrics in rocks, so sort of um, heterogeneous elements inside rocks to, to sort that out. So here's some examples of similar looking structures in geophysics. So here's an SC fabric that's taken out of the um, the Bashir and Trow textbook. So these are C uh, prime bands um, and these are um, muckers and, and quartz that are got the um, lenticular shape that have got um, um, sort of asymmetric uh, closure to it. So here's the um, central cooler craton. Here's a bunch of shear bands that you can see through here that have got a, a magnetite missing from them. So they're very clear and they're offsetting um, particular elements and truncating um, magnetic anomalies, and you can see those same lenticular shapes. Just to the, so that so that that example there is from there, and if you just go to the north of that, you've got these large um, um, plutons, and uh, and they've got a highly asymmetrical shape to them. Here's one through here, and here's another one through here, and you can find an analogous structures in the microscale. And so the good thing about this example is this. Uh, this Yerda shear zone, which goes across this, actually outcrops there. And where it outcrops is the kinematics are exactly identical to that predicted by that. It would be a worry if it wasn't. Okay. And all we're looking at is flow of rocks around um, rigid, rigid bodies in this case. Here's another example in the Musgrove blocks, one of my favorite examples because you've got um, um, uh, existing fabric in the rock are rotating around inside into. Um, um, parallelism with these um, shear zones that are very clear. Um, and this fault here steps across into the man fault here. And where it steps across is you see this subdued zone in the geophysical response. And that subdued zone is actually where you have uh, a series of um, sub basins um, filled with sediments that are, that are um, subduing the, the magnetic response. And that's happening in a, in a releasing vent. So the kinematics predicted through here um, and the step over is creating that restraining vent. So that's an example of the type of analysis. Um, this is just, uh, I, I really shouldn't talk to this because I even want to lose a little live, but I'll just say two things to this thing. Structural geology and structural geophysics are different in that the criteria that we use, not the geometries, um, to understand it uh, are quite uh, a different. So I'm going to give one example is that the SC fabric that I showed in the geophysics was uh, a uh, asymmetrical shaped um, magnetic body. So it could have been a layer or a dike or something like that. Whereas in a in a in a shear zone um, in that in that in that um, in the S fabric, that is a recrystallization process that creates that lenticular shape. So the geological processes that create those geometries are different, but the geometries end up being the same and therefore you can interpret it in the same way. So that's the only point I want to make. And oh, sorry, the second point I want to make is the advantage of doing it at the large scale in geophysics is you get the 
wholesale picture of what's going on, which is important, um, and you can do it undercover. But, all, but the limit of this approach is that it works best for strike slip um, faults and it's more difficult to do the kinematics, not impossible, on, um, on, um, on, on faults that have dip slip or, or vertical movements. I'm going to finish with geometry and then I'm going to talk about some of the prices and then we'll go on two slides. So, so um, we have um, fold interference patterns. So that's when super, folds are superimposed on each other, they create um, geometries. Most of us learn this in the second or third year of structural class um, and, uh, and then forget about it. But they, uh, they, tell you this, they tell you a lot. They tell you stuff about the geometry and also the sequencing of events. So you can even use the patterns um, of, the, of, um, of, of, of fold interference patterns to determine, um, help you determine the history of rocks. So here's a, here's a, 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 a type three, no, type two, sorry. This is, this is how it forms here. This is, so these, are, these three are all linked together. And what happens is you can have a recumbent fold and then you overprint it by an upright fold and you end up creating these arrowhead type geometries um, that reflect the interference between that recumbent fold generation and that upright fold generation. And in the geophysics here, you can see, you can map this layer around like this and it comes around there creating that arrowhead in, in that one's in light and you can just make some sort of call about that. Now, all I did in this case was went, oh, that looks like an arrowhead, therefore it must be a type two fold. And that must tell me that there's an overprint between a recumbent fold and an upright fold. That's the level of thinking. Here's the Davenport province, spectacular geology, big domal structures, similar to the, the, these sorts of patterns. And these are really formed by two generations of upright folds overprinting each other. So this is some sort of qualitative assessment that, that can be made on the rock to tell you something about the broad geometry. Of course, we don't we don't do that in structural geophysics. We like to do more quantitative approaches. I've talked about um, I've talked about um, Ford models. So here's another example from Alan Aiken's PhD um, crustal scale model. Um, we were looking at the uplift of the Moho through the Musgrave block in this case. Um, here's Tegan Blakey's PhD. Her project was very much. Um, uh, interested in whether we could use geophysical data sets to map the re relics of, uh, of Mar volcano explosion, so a very different problem. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's an example of her Ford model. So lots of you went out and collected her own data. That's the data um, distributed on, on the volcanic signature. And then she was able to map that out. And then she used a series of frames of those Ford models to produce a, a 3D model like that. So. Um, Again, I've showed you these ones. So here's an example of Ford model. The other type of model we do is um, inverse modeling, which is uh, we start with an a priori model and, and then we can um, we can uh, um, ask the, the algorithm to to modify um, either the, the rock properties and or the geometry, depending, or both, um, until it gets a satisfactory um, fit. And then we do historical modeling as well, which is not really fashionable anymore, but but it does help you with the learning process. So here's an example from Sheree Armistead's Honours project where she um, had to model a geometry in the, in the Kernamona province in the Illyria domain. And uh, she had those arrowhead sh shaped structures and she was able to model that geometry with uh, an overprint of a series of recumbent folds that were verging southward. And, that, and the interesting thing is with that, um, project was that everyone thought the recumbent folds in, in Mount Isa were northward um, verging. So that, even that outcome itself was interesting. We see a lot of inverse modeling happening, happening in an unconstrained way. And I'm going to, this slide is really designed to show you why that's a bullshit idea, um, to be perfectly frank. And, and lots of companies will tell you, let's run an inverse model, and I'll justify it by saying, that uh, it, it's the simplest model to constrain the geophysical response. And so this is from um, Robbins, who's in the audience, uh, PhD. Um, and, and, and this is a part of the Mount Painter block, which is sort of way up in the northern part of the Kernamona province, um, in, and just next to the northern Flinders ranges. 
and it's really, really, really deformed and, and, and quite messed up and it's got overprints of igneous rocks and then it's got an, an order vision overprint on top of that. And if you take the gravity data and you say on, on this on this volume of um, um, crust here, which is this is the surface expression, and you say get a, the best fit for this, it will create something that looks like this, okay, which is really simple but it makes no sense because it bears nothing towards the geology. Um, this is a historical model that, um, that Robin produced. Now, you know, it, it is an ex exercise in going insane to get a, a model that is this uh, well constrained. I think Robin might verify, but my understanding was 117 different events subtly changing the geometries to produce something which matched how Robin viewed it was. And then if you run a... Uh, uh, an inversion of something like that, this is what the geometry would look like. So look at the difference between that and that in terms of its um, detail. And, and to be quite frank, that's telling you nothing and that tells you a lot about that area. Now, there's a story behind this one. Um, and here's, a, here's basically um, how to do it. Now, the joke is it's this, to do this is only for the brave heart, but basically you start off with a series of Information events. This is um, not all of them, but you can see. And, and what what Robin really did was he laid up the stratigraphy, he deformed it with um, particular wavelengths, and then and then subtly um, modified elements of it to produce that. And then just like a, uh, intruded granites, etc., into it. Anyway, so so the thinking behind all of this can be summarised in in this uh, model and and. And this is kind of a, a, a loose summary of the way we would think about it in the structural geophysics group. We'd start with a map, and that, and that map could be a geological map. It could also be a geophysical interpretation. It's basically a surface, um, you know, a, a representation, a horizontal representation of what's going on. We might put forward models in which are constrained by rock properties and then use those four models to produce uh, um, help we produce a, an explicit um, 3D model. We can also take the map and produce an implicit one, or we can do this historical modeling. And this, we have, we, at the end of the journey, we come up with one model, which is what we call the a priori model. That's the starting point. And then we would apply um, inversions to it, which we would use the rock properties again. And then we would loop it around. Normally we'd make multiple models um, and loop it around multiple times, changing either the geometry of the rock property until we got a satisfactory fit. Okay, and um, and then on top of that, which I'm going to talk a bit, is is uh, um, some more um, newly developed um, Bayesian approaches that um, that are that are coming while they're here. So here's here's uh, here's the example of the case study in 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 um, Robin's PhD. I'd like to add that Robin is uh, his expertise is in isotopic chemistry. So he's the most skilled um, multidisciplinary interdisciplinary scientist that, that I know. So that's that's your plug for the year, please. So, um, but a truly amazing piece of um, work. This is how he started it. He basically took the data, built this model that was designed to um, designed to uh, try and represent a uh, three D volume. Of, of the complex geology that he, that he actually physically went out there and measured. And then he did this complex um, process, which I'm, I'm not really going to talk to you, except for, this, except for it's a more complicated version of the uh, process that I, uh, I showed before. So basically, he created um, the a priori model and then run a series of inversions um, systematically changing the property, the rock properties and all the geometries. And I think the method he alternated. So he did run one inversion where the properties were changed and then run the next version where the geometry was changed um, and kept alternating that until we got a, uh, a good um, fit. Um, and one of, the, one of the challenges of that model was in the gravity, we always had this, uh, this, uh, um, this deep low here and no matter... Um, how far we model um, this using this interpreted geometry, it never really um, landed a satisfactory fit. So the RMS was always um, uh, a fair way out in, in that part of the, of the model. So 
that's interesting because if you can't get the gravity to fit, it's telling you something that's fundamentally flawed with the model, which forced um, um, Robin to go away and think about what was what element was he's missing. So he ran a series of other um, um, models to see if he did it. And, and to cut to the chase, um, the model he ended up landing with required a, an intrusion of, uh, of this sort of scale and volume um, uh, to be in place to get that, um, that uh, a good match between the, um, the observed gravity and, and, and that model gravity. Sorry, so this, this model here is this volume here and this model here is, is, the, is, the, is the observed. So he's had to go away and think about it and, and come up with a, um, a, a different model. So that's the original model, and that's the model that he had to use in the end. So there is certainly um, a merit in going away and, and running these models. Okay, so that's the case study. So I'm going to talk briefly about the barriers for interdisciplinary uh, science, and uh, and there are many, um, and and so and especially structural geophysics. So here's, a, here's another quote. This is a guy from Mark Hadza, who was kind of doing his PhD at the same time as me in a, in a and, and he's now he's now a sort of a, 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 a broker and a wealthy guy in Canada, but he used to look like that. So um, but, but when he was running our frontier group in the in the 2000s, I caught up with him. And he uh, he said to me um, after around some Yamcha in, in Vancouver. I was asking what he was doing, where he was exploring and what was going on. And he said, I'm so frustrated. I said, he goes, I, I'm so tired of handing out 100 grand a year to graduates and I send them out in the field and then I, they come back after six weeks and they show me nothing. There's, they're too, he said, they're too scared to put a piece of line on the paper. And I said, so where's your frustration? And he goes, well, the problem is I don't care if the line's right or wrong, but without that line, I have nothing to work with in my decision-making process. And so I walked away from that conversation going, the yum chow was delicious, but, but actually it got me really thinking about um, why, why, were our, why were graduates reluctant to draw a line on a map or a geophysical image? And it, and it really is a confidence thing. But, you know, they went out there and they went, I'm too afraid to get it wrong. And that... And, and that actually is something that, that when you sit in the classroom, you also said that, you know, you, you set an assignment and they have to draw some lines and some images. And the first two hours they sit there, um, the students sit there in stunned uh, silence and make zero progress. And it's not until you actually draw a line, one line for them, do they, does it take off? And so there's this sort of um, stasis in thinking because there's a fear of getting it wrong um, that stops them from doing anything. So what's the challenge of the interdisciplinary science? Well, as I said, I think it's confidence and knowledge, um, and that knowledge and confidence are intimately linked. Um, and then it's also a language barrier. So for geologists, it is often where do I start? What line do I put on first there? What do I do it? And then it's about the, the, the language and the knowledge about what data you're looking at. So there's a data that's um, there in the, in the top, and I can look at that. And I can tell you that just from its um, texture and its color scheme, that's a tilt derivative of, uh, of an image, right? But, you know, you say, and I know what that means, whereas a, a, a geologist, if the geophysicist hands an image and says, here's a analytical signal or here's a tilt derivative or here's a vertical derivative, it's, a, it's gobbledygook to them. And so there's a sort of... You know, what am I looking at and how am I going to deal with this, right? And then, of course, the geophysicist wants to make it look pretty, so they put shadows on it and do all sorts of crazy stuff that actually makes the image uninterpretable. Okay, so that's the sort of stuff that, um, that fundamentally goes wrong. So those shades are great if you want to use it as an image to show what the image looks like, but it's not great to interpret. So understanding how the data is processed and what that process data tells you about the rocks is also significant, and that knowledge is fundamentally like there is a um, one of those word um, word images that, that graduates have filled out, and the number one biggest thing that they say that they wish they had to learn in their undergraduate is how to interpret and model geophysical data because they use it on a daily basis in their jobs, 
yet it doesn't usually get taught. And then the third challenge for a geologist is how do you take a physical property of the earth, in this case it's the mag distribution of magnetite in the upper crust essentially, and then convert it into something that's geological. And that's a big challenge. It's a big thought process. So I look at an image and go, oh, that's a granite or that's a pluton or that's a fold or that, you know, because I've got this armory of experience. But if you're just starting out, you're going, I don't know what that is. It's a blob. And so that's the challenge. But, you know, and the challenge for geophysicists are not knowing enough geology. Fundamentally, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're looking at. And so my would argue is how do you interpret something if you have no idea what it would even look like? So that's why if you let the geophysics community go health the leather at a geophysical image, you don't get, often get something that looks very geological. And different types of rocks are ambiguous, and that's as well. So we often get the same type of rock will give the same geophysical expression because it's got no magnetite in it, as an example. So this is the sort of um, challenges that we face. So I'm going to go back to this figure, and I'm going to tell you about the timeframes that it takes to do this, right? So... To make uh, interpretation takes weeks. To build the Ford models, depending how good you are or how easy they are, it's days to weeks. And then the inverse models are days to weeks and the historic models are days to months. That's Robin. And then we run the inversions and they take days to weeks. And so the whole process to start from you know, nothing to uh, 3D volume that's geophysically constrained with structural geology can be weeks to months. It's, and it's labour intensive. Okay, the, there's few groups on the planet that I believe can go from the start of that to the end of that process. PG and Geoscience is one of them. Okay, so you know they've got the the skill set to do that, but it is labour intensive. So I've got two more slides to go, three more slides to go, and I'll, and I'll stop. So Loop is a project that I am loosely affiliated with, and Laurent is the lead. He's in the audience. He is the leader of it, and he is a was he was a GoCat expert, was a GoCat expert, is, and uh, he fundamentally realised that um, was we weren't doing three D modelling um, very well, and uh, and so he and his collaborators, and see them all down there. It's mainly the geological surveys and some of the big companies who are really interested in in what Loop is, and and basically Loop is an integrated process where we take um, manage data, and then we try and build 3D models that are constrained by um, the, the, that knowledge plus um, geological information and geophysics at the same time. So that's the, that's the goal. So rather than going, let's do the geology and then let's do the geophysics and let's come up with an answer, it's like let's do the geology and, then, and feed the geophysics in. And do that. it's all Bayesian approach. And then with that is uncertainty. So it's open source software. So at the end of the, this journey, there will be a product out for the community um, that will be accessible. But the power of this is amazing. So I'm going to give you one example of it, which is this. So here's a geological map of the uh, Flinders Ranges and all those little red dots that are structural points. And you feed that information into the loop software. And in 15 minutes, you end up with a first, a first pass three-dimensional model of the geology. So all that, which, all that work that was taking weeks and weeks and weeks to do is now, because of this software, going to revolutionise the time that we do it. And, you know, and the, the advantage of this approach is that you can run many, many hundreds to thousands of models and find families of them. So um, that's... That's not a supercomputer either in 15 minutes or whatever. It's done on um, Laurent's shitty um, Dell Precision um, laptop that you can buy um, over the shelf. So amazing, hey? So this is, this is the future of, of, uh, of where, where this is all going. So this is the plug for Loop, and I know that Laurent is talking about this project in details in one month's time. Is that right, Jess? Maybe the end of August, I think it is. So maybe two months. Yeah. And, I, and, and you should go and absolutely see this one because it will blow you away. Okay, so last slide. So potential for geophysical data set is great for um, all sorts of analysis, multi-scale tectonics, structural analysis, because it both informs three-dimensional geometry, kinematics, and overprinting. Not necessarily in that order. Um, 
issue, the second point really talks to importing uh, importing knowledge, which is data and and what you understand how the work, work um, world works. Um, the workflow that we use, and I gave that really um, generalised workflow, but how we set up our workflow is is really related to the problem, and that includes the interpretation and and the style of modelling that you do. And we would never even consider to consider in our group to do an unconstrained inversion um, unless we wanted to show someone how rubbish it is, which is the only reason why that unconstrained version was ever produced. Um, I think there's about to be a revolution in, in structural geophysics um, with some of that automation of maps and, uh, and integrated 3D models that will bring in as part of the process, the geophysical analysis. So the geophysics is actually part of that 3D modeling um, capability. Um, but I, you know, the one caveat which I made a point of earlier is I think we have to be very mindful that once we start pressing buttons and asking um, software to build stuff for us, that we don't think that's replacing um, thinking about the problem. And I'm going to stop there.